In the next section, we're going to discuss stereoisomers. So stereoisomers are molecules that have the same formula and same connectivity, but they have different arrangements of atoms in three-dimensional space. In general, what we're going to see is that stereoisomers must be non-superposable. Superposable molecules are going to be identical. The first topic we're going to cover is another way of drawing molecules. This is called a Fischer projection, and it's a special way of drawing molecules that was invented in order to make it more easy to see the configurations of chirality centers when we have multiple chirality centers in a molecule. We're going to see that it's a uh, kind of a very artificial way to draw the molecule, that it has a lot of rules that are required in order to make it consistent. However, once we have those drawings, it will become very, very easy to compare stereoisomers and to determine if molecules are identical or what type of stereoisomer they are. I've laid out the, my, our discussion of how to draw Fischer projections in steps to show the steps that you would take when starting with a perspective drawing like this, where we have dashes and wedges, and converting it into a Fischer projection. What I've then done is taken an example molecule like this one, and I've illustrated how each step works to convert this structure ultimately into the Fischer projection. In the first step, what we're going to do is we're going to rotate the longest carbon chain so that it is fully eclipsed along every bond. Now, what I mean by that is that if we look at the shape of the carbon chain going from one group to a carbon along a bond, and then to the other part of the longest carbon chain. It can take two basic shapes. The first one would be where the uh, chain looks like a Z. It goes back and forth. We actually have a special term for this. If we look, this group and that group look almost trans to each other. However, they are not truly trans because we can rotate around the bond. So therefore, organic chemists have designated this the S-trans, which indicates or represents single bond trans. It's not really trans because we can rotate around the single bond, but it's one of the shapes of that rotation. What we can do then is we can rotate one of these groups. In my example, I've rotated the left-hand group 180 degrees around this bond. And what that does then is that makes the chain take on a U-shape, which we call the S-cis conformation. So what we're going to do is go along the longest carbon chain, rotate one bond, into the U-shape, then go to the next bond, rotate it into the U-shape. We're just going to continue till all of the bonds in the entire carbon chain are in the S-cis or U-shaped conformation. Next, we're going to take that molecule and we are going to turn it in space so that carbon number one according to the naming rules for numbering carbons, is at the top of the chain, and the rest of the chain is vertical on the paper. So it looks something like this. So the chain at this point is still flat in the plane, and all of the groups that are not part of the parent chain are on uh, wedges or dashes perpendicular to that chain. Now, 
it is possible to encounter Fisher projections that are technically incorrect, where carbon number one is not at the top, it's instead at the bottom, or even in rare cases where carbon number one is written left or right. These are technically not correct, and we should try always to put carbon number one at the top. Once we have that molecule oriented vertically, then what we're going to do is that we're, we're going to imagine looking at it from a particular direction. And that direction is imagining that we are looking at it from in between these, these V's, the wedge and the dash, of the bonds that are not part of the main parent chain. Another way to think of this is if we look at the parent chain and we look at a specific carbon atom in that chain, that carbon atom would have two groups going away from it that would be flat in the plane. We, and those two groups, the bonds connected to them, would come to a point at that carbon atom. We want that point right here pointing toward our face. So one of the ways we can represent this then is if we were looking in this direction, this group would be straight up and down going away from us. This one would be straight up and down in the plane. And these two groups would both be pointing toward our faces as wedges. So it would look something like this. We then imagine taking that molecule that we have stretched out like this and smashing it flat into the paper so that these wedges that are currently sticking out would smash flat and these bonds, some of which would be on dashes, would also smash flat. That would look something like this or like this. We then redraw the molecule with the longest carbon chain as just a line and each chirality center being a cro uh, across the two bonds. So we form for this chirality center across on the parent chain line, on this chirality center across on the parent chain line, and we omit the carbon atoms at the chirality centers. So it looks something like this. So you can see all the dashes and wedges are now gone. However, they are implied to be on the molecule. Specifically, it is implied that the two groups that are horizontal, in other words, going left and right, are on wedge bonds pointing toward our face. Now, this is the correct way to draw Fisher projections. However, I do need to point out that in biochemistry, unfortunately, when biochemists use Fisher projections, they draw carbons at the crosses, which you're not supposed to do because if you draw carbons, then it just looks like a Lewis structure. And it's not necessarily clear that we should be implying this three-dimensionality. Nevertheless, biochemists do that. And so I just want to warn you that you will see in biochemistry textbooks structures that look like this with carbons written there that are intended to be Fisher projections. Now one of the things that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to look at two Fisher projections and compare them and ask, are they the same or are they mirror images or are they just neither mirror images but not the same? Now, when we're comparing two Fisher projections then, it will be possible that on immediate inspection, it will, we can notice that, for example, one Fisher projection is just rotated 90 degrees compared to the other one. So we would say, well, we could put these right on top of each other if we just rotate one 90 degrees, then they would slide on top of each other. In that case, those would not actually be the same. 
when you take a Fisher projection and you rotate it 90 degrees, you mess up the implied wedges and dashes in the molecule. And you, in fact, reverse them, causing the molecule to be the mirror image. So if we're comparing Fisher projections, Fisher projections will only be the same if they are rotated 180 degrees. If they are rotated 90 degrees, then those Fisher projections become mirror images. The other thing we have to be careful of is that if we're comparing two Fisher projections, we cannot rotate them to make them the same by lifting them up off of the paper, flipping them over left to right 180 degrees, and then putting them back down. If we were to actually do that with the Fisher projection and then enforce the wedge, the implied wedge and dashes, we would see that those molecules would become mirror images. So again, uh, we have to be careful when comparing Fisher projections to rotate them only 180 degrees when trying to superpose them and not to lift them out of the plane of paper, to only rotate them on the plane of the paper.